Good evening. A disaster over the skies of Cerritos. I'm Jose Sanders. And I'm Bill Stout. We have the worst kind of tragedy to report tonight. In the middle of a sunny day, in the middle of a holiday weekend, a small plane collided with an Aeromexico jet over a middle-class neighborhood. There are no survivors. At least 72 people have been killed, 64 on the DC-9 jet, three on the private plane, and at least five on the ground. Here's what it looked like shortly after the wreckage came crashing through the quiet neighborhood of Cerritos. The planes collided shortly after noon, burning wreckage scattered everywhere, homes and lives destroyed, an entire neighborhood looking as if it had just been bombed. Cerritos, about 30 miles southeast of downtown Los Angeles, surrounded by larger communities such as Norwalk and Buena Park and Artesia. The specific area where the debris scattered is near 183rd Street and Carmenita. Flames from the crash could be seen from the nearby Artesia Freeway. We have extended coverage of the disaster. Now we begin with uh, Dave Lopez, who's been at the scene of the disaster all afternoon. He's been talking with eyewitnesses, with firemen, the National Transportation Safety Board, everyone involved in any way. And Dave is still in Cerritos. We go to him now for this live update. Dave. Looking down the street, Home Street, where uh, much of that plane crashed, we just finished talking to a spokesman from Aeromexico who told us that the last stop of that flight was in Tijuana. He also told us that he believes the majority of the passengers on board were tourists returning from a holiday in Mexico. He said that the majority of the names are Hispanic, but of course that doesn't mean much uh, these days, uh, whether they are from Mexico, whether they are, are people from the Southern California area, just by looking at the names could not tell if most of the people were from Mexico or from here. But he did believe that most of them were tourists returning from that vacation spot. The plane was, la was due to land at LAX at 12.05. He said that there had been contact with the pilot in the tower about 20 minutes prior to that. Everything was fine. The pilot said everything was on course and he was going to be making a landing at 12.05. Then they didn't hear anything. They started hearing rumors and they said there was shock and disbelief that it was the Aeromexico plane. We have some tape of what this neighborhood looked like shortly after the impact. The, the crash, 11.53 precisely. And people who heard it said it sounded like a couple of bombs exploding. One man said he thought it was an earthquake. You are now looking at part of the fuselage. The plane came down from what witnesses have told us on its back. It hit a home. It hit the, the edge of a house. It crashed into six other homes and then there was fire all around. People began running from their homes. Uh, people began uh, screaming, trying to find out just who was in these homes, where they were. Uh, an unbelievable situation. Uh, people started coming into the neighborhood. Uh, a few women actually fainted when they saw what was there. Carmenita bodies were strewn all up and down Carmenita. Again, you're taking a look at all this, the wreckage. Uh, almost instantaneous fire, according to most of the people that we have talked to. One man told us that he actually saw a man pulling three children out of a house. Uh, we have now confirmed that that did happen, that the in injuries were only minor. A couple of firefighters were injured, twisted ankles, one suffered some burns. This neighborhood, a very quiet, normal neighborhood, about the only way you can describe it, and it is in shock. I have one man who has to be described as a hero because he pulled out a 14-year-old boy, Wayne Nelson. Mr. Nelson, your house is all but destroyed, is that correct? Uh, half my house uh, was burned, I guess, by the fire. Uh, it was not hit by the plane. The house next to us was hit by the plane. Uh, we heard it coming down, a tremendous roar, the engines. It exploded, it hit, it exploded. Uh, it was all I could do to get my family out of the house. We, I, I thought that was the end of it. Now, how, how was it that you rescued the young 14-year-old boy? Well, we got out of the house, we got out of our house. And I didn't really know what had happened. I knew something bad had happened, but I ran around to the other side to see it, and all I saw was where the house used to be. And I'm standing there in disbelief, wondering what to do. The, the fire was tremendous. Uh, and then I saw the youngest boy kind of stumble out of his, out of the wall there. So I went back and I got him, and I helped him out. Do you know his name? Um, Alex. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Stories like that all over, uh, people uh, helping other people. Uh, this neighborhood's in shock, and it's going to be quite a while before they find out how many people are in that debris. If there are any, we now have confirmed five, at least five on the ground killed. It could climb. I'm Dave Lopez reporting live from Cerritos. Dave, have a good day. And this evening, dozens of National Transportation Safety Board investigators are on their way from Washington. Their task to sort out the data and explain, if they can, exactly what happened. 
Shocked eyewitnesses are already recounting that horrifying crash. Reporter Ann Curry has been there most of the day. She was first on the air from the scene, and she has some of their chilling stories. It happened in this quiet Cerritos neighborhood. The Aeromexico DC-9 collided mid-air with a small engine plane, then plunged headlong into people's homes, cutting a path through roofs as residents watched helplessly. Just a giant explosion occurred, and there was a big flame. And after the flame, the heat attacked all these houses, and fire was going everywhere. And um, I grabbed some neighbors, and we ran down the street and just broke into houses trying to get people out. I thought it was an earthquake. It was, I just saw wooden pieces bursting. I couldn't see anything when I saw that, you know, a huge flame, and I called 911, and it's busy. Rigo Uribe could hear the terror. We heard people moaning and screaming and kids. And... He was standing in the middle of this street when he heard the screams and the moans, and the sounds were coming from that house. It was where the DC-9 finally stopped, but nothing could have saved the people screaming inside. The explosion and a ball of flame leveled the homes and left only pieces of the DC-9 intact. The three people inside the small engine plane could not save themselves either. They spiraled downward nose first, crashing three blocks from the DC-9 in this Cerritos Elementary School field. There was an off-duty officer that came up and I told him, yes, they're, they're deceased and uh, there's, just no, there's just no way. The wreckage stretched for miles. In it, the firemen found plane seats. One found a child's shoes. And as investigators arrived to piece together why all this happened, the people who live here can only relive the nightmare. This family discovered it returning home from church. In their shock, several who saw it uh, happen pointed out that the plan was fly plane was filing, flying unusually low before the crash. It will be up to investigators to see if all of that checks out. Now, and again, you were one of the first reporters out there on the scene. Yes. Uh, a lot of people are expressing surprise that emergency crews were there so quickly. Is that what you found they when you were there? They got there very quickly, but the bottom line is that there was such devastation that they found that the people who lived there had to pitch in to help get everybody out. And in fact, we talked to several people who pulled hoses with the firemen, who banged on doors, tried to get people outside. It was just such a terrible mess. The firemen needed all the help they could get. Mm, lots of uh, courageous stories to come. It's Thank true. you. There are hero stories in this. Appreciate it. Well, for the people on the plane, it was a moment of horror. But for the people on the ground who witnessed the crash, that horror will last for a lifetime. Channel 2's Patty Ecker talked with some residents of Cerritos who could only sit and watch in terror as the two planes fell from the sky. Patty. Well, Jose, we are now in the Red Cross Evacuation Center, a temporary evacuation center at 103rd in Carmenita. This is a place that will become a source of information, a source of shelter, a, short, a source of comfort for the victims and the relatives of the victims of today's crash. There are really only a handful of people here, but there are hundreds of volunteers ready to help those victims. This was a neighborhood of friends, said one man. A close-knit community, said another stunned resident. In one instant, the neat gardens, the patios, the homes became 300 yards of debris. I just saw the shadow of the plane and the loudness and then the boom. The human toll will not be known for some time. Fire officials are sure no survivors remain in what's left of 20 houses, but they don't know which victims are from the jet and which from the neighborhood. So officials and friends ask who was home, who was not. The Nelson family was home eating lunch, all except Robbie, who was outside. The, the airplane, first it was high, then it came down about to our roof, then it turned. Can you describe the noise? It was just like the loudest thing I'd ever heard, and I heard it getting closer, and I kind of knew we were dead at that point. And then when we weren't, when the house kind of exploded around us, I grabbed the kids, and my youngest boy was out in the garage, and he had come up. He saw the plane come down, and when he he was coming up to the, to the front, and we just looked to make sure we had all of our family around. We got him here. We got out. Their neighbors were not as lucky. They speak of the mother who had gone to the store when tragedy struck her home. Now she waits inside an undamaged house, asking, where's her husband? Where's her son? Who tells them? Who, who tells them? I don't know. The concern now, of course, is for the survivors and the people who must now patch back their lives. I am with Ralph Wright of the American Red Cross at the evacuation center. Ralph, tell me what's available here. Right now, we're taking down information of people who are looking for relatives. People have to come in here, though. 
Uh, we're also providing them with some place where victims can get away uh, from the press of people. Where they, we have some counselors here to work with them. So when you're distraught, you can meet with a priest or a pastor or, or some psychologist. Uh, in addition, we're providing food and we'll be moving the folks over to Cerritos High School where we'll be setting up all night uh, facilities where people are able to get some sleep. You know, I think the question that everyone is asking is what kind of numbers are we talking about? Do you have any idea how many families you're going to have to be concerned about? This partially depends upon the FAA and the parameters of the area in which they cordon off for the purposes of trying to determine the crash site. Uh, however, we feel that probably we're talking about 25, 30 families. We're not talking large numbers because the safety uh, officers have allowed the people to come back into the area. Ralph Wright of the American Red Cross, thank you. Ralph said one thing, that what the Red Cross needs now and what the victims needs now really will be contributions of money to help the victims. And he also said, please don't call. There's no real number to get information. But if you want to come down, you can come to the evacuation center, which is what, Cerritos Elementary School, Cerritos High School. Cerritos High School. Cerritos High School. And there you can find information if that's necessary. This is Patty Ecker reporting live from Cerritos. A long night ahead, Patty, and a lot of terrible stories I'm sure we'll be hearing. There is just so much devastation, it's difficult to understand the size and scope of this accident. But the view from the air gives a clear picture. Jim Forbes has been up in Chopper 2 all day long. Let's go to him live, Jim. Well, Bill, certainly to the people who are involved with this tragedy, it must seem as though their entire world has been destroyed. But what is so starkly evident from the sky is so little of it has been. There are a lot of miraculous occurrences with this tragedy. First of all, the NTSB has restricted our airspace. We're a little higher than we'd like to be than we were earlier. Let's take a look at some of the scenes that we saw earlier today. The area impacted is a very small, really one square block area, maybe a dozen homes were hit. Now, why that is unusual is it appears that the tail section severed from the Aeromexico jet, we've seen it a mile and three quarters east of the impact of the fuselage. It appears that severed in air. Witnesses have said they've seen it, in fact. When that happens, the plane loses its rudder. It can no longer steer, and pilots I've spoke to this afternoon tell me when a plane loses its aerodynamics, it's as much as hitting a brick wall and it goes straight down. Now, while that was quite unfortunate, obviously, for the airliner, it meant that many in this neighborhood were probably saved because we don't see much the same destruction we often see in this type of um, uh, airplane crash where a, a plane will almost skid into its crash point. In this case, a very congested, quiet neighborhood. So it was fortunate that the plane went straight down. Now, the other information I have to tell you is with two interviews with two eyewitnesses. Um, the first is a pilot who was in the air. He was at about 1,500 feet. He believes he saw the impact almost instantaneously. A flash caught his eye. He looked over. The second witness was on the ground. He, too, was a pilot. He says he was about three miles away. Both those witnesses, pilots experienced, say they believe the Aeromexico jet was certainly no more than 4,000 feet in the air possibly as low as 3,000. Now they say all due caution in that, that their angles, their um, uh, the relative judgment is certainly thrown off, but these are pilots. They believe it was at least 4,000 or below at that point. Now we're told also by pilots, those two as well as others, that it's customary to be six or 7,000 in an approach to LAX from this vantage point. It is legal to be as low as four and three if in fact the controller brings you that low. They have, we have no idea at this point, of course, if they were, if the Aeromexico jet was told to be that low. And again, it's speculation that he was, but two experienced pilots say he was four or below. Now, the one pilot on the ground said he saw the private jet, private prop plane rather, coming at a horizontal spin right side up. And he feels that if the pilot was conscious, he would have been able to pull out of it and bring his plane down safely. On the other hand, the pilot who was in the air and saw the collision, or just after the collision, believes that the jetliner was coming down almost vertically at most perhaps a 20 degree angle. And that would coincide with what we said earlier that the tail section had been severed apparently in the air and that um, at that point a plane loses all rudder and it's like hitting a brick wall and goes straight down. A final point is the pilot in the air believes that the collision was probably head on or almost head on that if the two noses didn't collide, then perhaps the, the private jet or private plane hit one of the wings, but both coming at each other in a head-on manner. Uh, Bill and Jose, back to you in the newsroom. Okay, Jim. Thanks a lot. 
Now, we will have more live coverage of the Flight 498 disaster over Cerritos when we continue. Including a live report from the L.A. airport where relatives waited for a flight 